Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes for the research we do here. Each of the next 12 talks will come from one of the six new themes, two from each. For more info on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Giles Yeo. Giles is many things. He is a scientist and a group leader at the Metabolic Diseases Unit. He is a fellow of Wilson College. He is a broadcaster, an author, a newly formed podcaster, and uh, and his work, as you, as many of you will know, um, surrounds uh, the genetics of obesity and the genes and the influence of genes on feeding behavior and body weight. So I've been so looking forward to this talk all term, Giles. And I'm sure many of the rest of us have as well. So over to you. And thank you so much for, for coming to talk to us today. Dovla, thank you so much for A, the kind um, in, in introduction, which I now have to live up to. Thanks. Um, um, but, but also, no, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, having, me, for having me on. So uh, guys, I'm here to talk about appetite. And you said, well, I thought I was here to talk about obesity. Well, actually, um, you know, I do study the genetics of obesity. I'm a geneticist by trade, but we now know that almost by its very definition, studying the genetics of obesity is studying the, gen the genetics of how our brain influences our feeding behavior. I'll set that out um, as we go along. You can believe me or not believe me when we actually get, uh, get, get to the end of this. But I, I think being a geneticist, which I am, um, both as an at undergraduate level and in my PhD and what I do now, um, it's a perfectly upstanding thing to do. You know, my mother-in-law still speaks to me and this is a fabulous thing. Um, but when people ask what I study and I tell them body weight, of which obesity happens to sit on one end of the spectrum, um, immediately I become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, people who are overweight, people living with obesity, terms I do not use in any pejorative fashion whatsoever, an excuse. Philosophically, it's always been an interesting thing to, to, to take because if I was studying the genetics of dementia, the genetics of uh, cancer, the genetics of rheumatoid arthritis or any other disease, would I suddenly be giving those people suffering from those conditions an excuse? No, right? I'd be trying to understand biology, mechanism. I mean, God forbid, I might be trying to help somebody. But yet, when we talk about body weight, suddenly it becomes a choice, right? Suddenly it becomes a sin. These are these are these are the things, bad habits, bad, you know, bad choices. And this in many reasons is this is the reason why. Okay, so you, everyone has seen um, these scales of justice, this, en this famous energy balance equation. And other, actually, it's otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. You can't magic energy into your body and you certainly can't magic energy away. So the only way you're going to be able to gain weight is to eat more than you burn. And the only way to lose weight, ergo, is to burn more than you eat. Stop. I know what you're thinking. Did he just say eat less and move more? Yes, I did. That's because it's physics. But it's the how. How we get to the body weight we are is going to be down to physics. How can it not be? The biological variation, however, does not lie in the physics. The biological and genetic variation lies in the why. Why do people behave so very differently around food? So just as an example, why do some people respond to stress by eating, whereas other people respond to stress by not eating? It's the same hormone. It's cortisol, yet diametric opposite responses. Why do some people love food? I love food. Why do other people use food as fuel? How come some people take more food to become full, whereas others take less? All of these are different feeding behaviors, different reactions around food. The why, and ultimately the why influences the how, because the why influences your liking or dislike or driving towards food, making you say yes or no, making you small, medium, and large in the current environment that we actually um, 
um, that we actually live in. And now, as I said, by studying the genetics of body weight, we are almost by its very definition studying the genetics of how our brain influences food intake. Okay, so where is the evidence for, for, for this? Your brain needs to know two pieces of information in order to influence your food intake. First, it needs to know how much fat you have. And this is an important piece of information because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. If your sources of food stopped today, how long would you live for? Okay. Now, what happens is fat secretes hormones, in particular a hormone called leptin. We'll talk about that in a second. It circulates in the blood, signals to the brain, and then uh, um, lets your brain know how much fat you have. But it doesn't own, your brain doesn't only need to know the long-term energy stores. Your brain also needs to know its short-term energy stores. And this involves what you are eating and what you have just eaten. These signals are going to come from your gut, your gastrointestinal tract. So every mouthful of food we eat, as it goes down the esophagus into our stomach and out the other side, the whole, the whole tube, food to poop tube, gives off hormones which signal to the brain. What happens is your brain senses these long and short-term nutritional signals, then letting your brain know what the, what is happening in your body, and then translates these signals, integrates these signals, and influences your next interaction with a menu, a supermarket, um, or your refrigerator. Now, I have given the name, the title of the talk, as, as, as you might, well, you may not have seen it, is the brain control of appetite. That's fine. Can an old dog teach us new tricks? Slightly cryptic. There are two dogs in this um, in, in this narrative, which I'm going to give you today. There's an actual dog. You'll see a pretty that's going to be pretty clear. But there's also a metaphorical dog, you know. And I'll point it out when we actually when we actually uh, um, get to this to, to 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 this metaphorical dog, because we're coming next, okay? But they're genetic, and the critical thing is they're genetic modifiers that run throughout this entire process, which we can harness in order to identify new biology and new and and and, and new pathways. And so the pathway I want to focus on today, because I thought it best just to focus on one pathway and give you some level of detail, is the fat sensing pathway. Okay, this is the key fat sensing pathway within the brain, and it's called the leptin melanocortin pathway. And what is the leptin melanocortin pathway? It's leptin being produced from fat, and it circulates in the blood in proportion to fat. The more fat you have, the more leptin you have. It circulates in the blood, and then it signals to the brain in particular, a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And within the hypothalamus, a leptin signals to POMC neurons, okay? And when it signals to POMC neurons, these are post-translationally modified into a number of different peptides called the melanocortin peptides, the eponymous melanocortin peptides, which signal to melanocortin receptors, melanocortin-4 receptor in particular, leading to a uh, regulation of food intake. That's just a summary. I'm going to go back and, and, and cite examples. But this is the old dog, the metaphorical old dog I'm told, to tell, telling you guys about. Why is it an old dog? It's an old dog because the main components of the pathway, leptin, leptin receptor, POMC, MC4, et cetera, et cetera, they were all uh, uh, worked out, okay, illuminated, shall we say, in a golden period of obesity genetics between 1997 and the year 2000, okay, through human and murine genetics. So why am I here talking to you guys today, okay, about 22-year-old data? And I guess the question is, can this old dog teach us new tricks? I hope so. Otherwise, this would be a very short talk. So, 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 that, so there we go. I'm, I'm beating the analogy to death. I'm really sorry about this. So I just wanted to give you some my thoughts on, 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 on this pathway. What, what new have we learned from it? But just to take, take you through this fat-sensing pathway and really to show you how crucial this pathway is in the control of food intake, not only in humans, not only in humans, not only in mice, which I know we actually study, but actually in a really quite a wide range of different, of, of, of different creatures. Um, um, uh, it's been conserved through evolution, okay? So let's start at the very beginning as, um, as uh, uh, you know, do, re, mi, okay? And um, let's deal with leptin deficiency. So this is what happens if you don't have leptin, uh, if you don't have leptin. So this is a child, okay, without any leptin. And you can see he's a three-year-old weighing 42 kilograms. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not Coca-Cola obesity. This is not, I played a bit too much PlayStation obesity. This child lacks leptin. And what are the implications of this? The implications of this are that because in effect, the child has no, the brain has no way of sensing how much fat this child has. When don't you have fat? 
you don't have fat when you're starving. Okay, that's when you don't have fat in, from an evolutionary perspective. So in spite of this poor child's body habitus, he has a brain who thinks he is starving. As a result, it makes him eat a lot. Okay, not only eating a lot, but also with hyperphagia, hyperphagic behavior, hyper for more, phagic for eat. And it's a pathogenic term. You don't say, oh, I was hyperphagic last night. No, mate, you ate too much. Hyperphagia, these kids have to have their freezer doors locked up because they'll actually go in and actually have frozen food. So then the question is, given that leptin is a hormone, it's a fat hormone and a dip of kind, you know, can it be replaced? Okay, and so this is work done by my, by my head of department um, um, and, and colleague, Professor Stephen O'Ratley, Professor Sir Stephen O'Ratley. And um, he identified these first, um, these first kids with leptin deficiency. And he asked the question, okay, well, hang on a second. If we take type one diabetes as an analogy and you can replace um, um, insulin, okay, when you don't have insulin, replace insulin in order to manage your glucose homeostasis, can you replace a leptin in order to manage your fat homeostasis? And so this child now, three years old, and it's uh, seven years old, 32 kilos, except for daily injections of leptin. And you can see the dramatic change. You wouldn't look at, you wouldn't uh, um, bat an eyelid now passing this, this, this kid because the kid looks perfectly normal. And so from here, okay, we begin to realize that leptin is a signal and, and to, to the brain telling you how much fat you have. And if you replace it and suddenly your brain says, oh, I've got fat again, you begin to eat, you, you do begin to eat normally. Now, this does beg the question, though, because if you look at this publication, which is 1999, um, um, Faruqi et al., Steve is, uh, uh, um, you know, she was Steve's clinical fellow at the time. How come leptin is not the panacea for obesity? You know, how can we still have an obesity problem if we can give people leptin? Because the role of leptin was not to let the brain know, ooh, I have too much fat, eat less. The role of leptin is to say that, oh, if you don't have enough fat, turn on the starvation response. So leptin doesn't function when there's loads of it sloshing about. It functions when it goes away, which is why if you give more leptin to me, I have leptin, to any of you who have a functioning leptin system, you do not respond, um, um, you know, certainly when it comes to, when it comes to changing your, your food intake, all right? So leptin at all uh, levels, at, at, at throughout the entire spectrum, lets your brain know how, 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 much, how much is there, but it's only when there's too little of it does it trigger significant biological changes because that is its key role to turn on the starvation response. Now, what happens now when leptin signals to the brain? I mentioned POMC. So what is POMC? POMC is pro-opio-melanocortin and it is a, a complex pro-polypeptide and it's post-translationally modified into a number of biologically active moieties, the eponymous melanocortin peptides. The, these are alpha, beta, and gamma melanocyte stimulating hormone, or MSH, and adrenocorticotrophin, or ACTH. And they really uh, mediate a wide variety of different functions via five different melanocortin receptors, the melanocortin 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 receptors, okay? Just as an example about the range of, of functions it, it mediates, the melanocortin 1 receptor tends to be present on, um, uh, on the skin, in, in, the, in, in, in hair, and it regulates skin color and hair color. So natural redheads amongst you, Okay, you're gonna have uh, um, you're gonna have polymorphisms within the MC1 receptor, which make you redhead and freckly. All right. Now, actually, 40% of white European Caucasians are gonna be heterozygous for these polymorphisms, making you less likely to be able to stand in the sun. You burn easily in the sun, even if, even though you're brunette or you have dark hair. Okay, um, um, but you can't actually stay in the sun for very long. And a large part of that is going to be down to polymorphisms within the MC1 receptor. Then there's the MC5 receptor, for example, and that is crucial for the, the, um, the production of natural sebaceous oils. So it is, it is, it is in sebum gland, okay? And so therefore it's sebaceous oils. Um, the MC2 receptor is, is responsible for adrenal development and steroidogenesis. But the two receptors I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk are the MC4 receptor first, and then tilting back to some new data we actually have on the MC3 receptor. But you'll see that aside from the MC2 receptor, which is monogamous for the ACTH, for ACTH, all of the other receptors bind to differing, with, with differing affinities to all of the different, um, all of the different peptides that are, um, that, that, that are actually there. And what is the direct evidence that we actually have a role um, um, of, oh, oh, and the MC3 and MC4 receptor are the brain, are, are receptors that express within the brain. All the rest are peripheral receptors, MC3, MC4 receptor, central nervous system up there, okay? 
So now what is the evidence, direct evidence that POMC plays a role in, um, in, in, in NG homeostasis? Well, this was actually identified first in 1998, ODOG, as I said, by the group of uh, Heiko Kruda and Annette Grutus and the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Okay, and they identified this child who had a compound heterozygous mutation in POMC, which meant that the, the child was in effect null for POMC. So what does uh, um, the phenotype of someone without POMC look like? It reflects the complexity of the, of, of, of the, of the hormone, of, of, the, of the polypeptide. So he has bright red hair because of a lack of melanocortin action, as I said on EMC1 receptor. He has isolated ACTH deficiency and underdeveloped adrenal gland because of a lack of action at the MC2 receptor. And he has severe obesity and hypophagia because of a lack of melanocortin action at the MC4 receptor. Now at this point, I could show you work uh, um, that we did in, in, in the mouse knockout in order to work out pathways. But I thought I would just share some data. Some of you may have heard about this, some not, but that was relatively recent. And this is our work on Labrador retrievers. Um, I don't know if any of you out there have Labradors, um, but uh, I'm not a doggy person, but I learned a lot from my colleague, Eleanor Raffin, um, who's now actually a, a lecturer at PDN. And um, she still leads the study. Um, but she's a vet. She's a veterinary surgeon that uh, did her PhD in human genetics and then and then went back to becoming becoming a vet. And the thing about Labradors is they're the most popular pet dogs in the UK and in North America um, because of their wonderful, I mean, for, for Pete's sake, in this country, we use them to sell toilet paper, right? They're the Enrex puppy. Um, and the thing about these Labradors, though, they have wonderful temperament, thus wonderful family pets. But any of you who own Labradors know keep your compost bin shut because the Labrador will be in in a shot and try and eat everything there till they nearly pop. Okay. There are, they are probably the most food motivated dog um, out there. This is what Eleanor tells me. Um, anyway, so she was always interested in the, in the reasons why um, this dog were quite so food, these dogs were quite so food motivated. To cut a long story short, these dogs, a percentage of Labradors have a deletion in POMC. All right. Now it leaves the adrenal gland alone because it's a partial deletion. So it has ACTH, but it deletes the C terminus of the, of the protein. But not all Labradors have it. So you can do a genotype phenotype correlation. And here's plotting wild type for the deletion, heterozygous, homozygous, and this is body weight. And you can see that each deletion is worth a couple of kilograms of body weight, so, such that the homozygous uh, uh, Labrador is on average four kilos heavier than a wild type Labrador. Doesn't sound like a lot until you remember that Labradors only really get to 30 to 35 kilos. So four kilos is a lot of dog. Um, and then when we plot food motivation, which is the key, the, the, the key element here, you'll see exactly the same pattern. So it is likely that the food motivation is driving the, 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 the body weight, the body weight phenotype. So this is what I've said, um, 1.9 kilos uh, per deletion allele or 0.3 of a standard deviation of, of, of body weight or so. But so far, so not so interesting, really, because I've shown you that kids, human beings, um, um, find that they need POMC, otherwise they're severely obese. I've spoken about the fact that we had mice, so surely it's not surprising if dogs, if dogs have the mutation as well. And it isn't, it wasn't surprising. This was what was surprising, however, all right? So now um, we'll leave that alone. So um, as I said, not all Labradors have it. Maybe about 20 to 25% of Labradors will actually have this, um, have this mutation. So 75% of Labradors are actually wild type for it, but 95% of them are very food motivated. So Eleanor at the moment is throwing the genetic book at this. Okay, she's whole genome sequencing, you know, whole exome, GWAS, the full works to try and find other genetic drivers. But clearly deletion in POMC is one of the key drivers. But there is, a, there is a, a sting at the end of the tail. You know, there is a denouement to this tail. And now Labradors are not only wonderful family pets because of their temperament, they're also very, very trainable. In fact, they're so trainable that they're primarily used as guide dogs for the blind, certainly in North America and in Europe. And like guide dogs are like the Navy SEALs of the dog world, right? Because they're, they're trained within an inch of their life because they're about to be given a human being to look after for the rest of their life. And loads of failure. Okay, it's like a huge, very steep pyramid, and those who fail become pets. So it's the few, the proud, the guide dogs. And they're trained with food using standard Pavlovian you know, tra training behaviors. And so here's the very interesting thing. With such a huge selection pressure, 80% of successful guide dogs have the deletion in POMC, making them more food motivated. So here is the concept. So imagine I am the guide dog, and I'm bringing back visually impaired Mr. Smith. All right. So imagine if a chicken suddenly ran across the road during this uh, uh, excursion. What are the chances of chicken for dinner? 50-50, 80-20, doesn't matter. 
the guide, the successfully trained guide dog knows it has a 100% chance of dinner if he brings Mr. Smith home. So we started by looking at food motivation and suddenly we started by looking at food motivation and suddenly backed ourselves into trainability. And we, we ended up on the, um, on the cover of the, of the journal. That's Jasper, a chocolate Labrador, one of the participants. And that's Eleanor, who, I, as I said, um, still leads the study. So for those of you with Labradors, when you go home and you look, oh, look, Fido loves me, big googly eyes. He doesn't love you, he's hungry. <sighs> it's terrible, it's terrible, it's a terrible thing. All right, so we're moving down a pathway. We have Lepton, tickling Pomsi. Now, Pomsi then gets chopped up into melanocortin peptides and they signal to the MC4 receptor. And 1998 now, old dog, old dog. This is actually when I pitched up. I'm an old dog too. And this was my um, first uh, publication actually in my postdoc. Um, it was just a year. I got my PhD in 1997 and we, I, with Steve Ratley, uh, um, um, no, I didn't get it from Steve Ratley. My first postdoc was from Steve Ratley. And we identified that mutations in the MC4 receptor resulted in dominantly inherited human obesity. Now, the interesting thing about the MC4 receptor, two things, is um, we now know that it is far more common that we had than we had originally thought or envisaged. And it is now a key single gene driver for really quite a, I wouldn't say a large proportion, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how common it is in the, in, in, in the next slide, but it is the commonest uh, single gene cause of obesity. The other interesting thing about, about MC4 receptor is its phenotype you, uh, that you actually end up when you have the mutation, all right? So now um, the MC4 receptor is a G protein couple receptor and it's tethered to cyclic AMP. So when you chuck on a ligand, and, uh, melanocortin, you end, you end up with cyclic AMP, you have an assay. So just to, 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 to let you know, the left-hand side of this slide was done by me, this is now 2003, was done by me using recombinant protein in, in, in tissue culture in a lab. Okay. Whereas the right-hand side, this was done by the clinical team of uh, Professor Faruqi in a clinical research facility. And never the twain shall meet. I'm not a clinician. So here, you'd be unsurprised to see that some of the mutations that we found in the MC4 receptor are particularly severe, deletions, et cetera, et cetera, and they kill the receptor dead. Whereas others, point mutations, you know, single amino acid changes, you end up with partially functioning, functioning re receptor anywhere from 30 to 70%, say. Now, on the right-hand side, you see that Sadaf has actually um, established a feeding assay of sorts for children. It's far more difficult to do this in adults because adults are very, um, it gets self-conscious. You can do this in kids. And so I need you to focus, first of all, on the red bars. And you can see the big red bar, that's leptin deficiency, the first child I showed you. And the second bar, the lower bar, is treated leptin deficiency. You can see when you give leptin, hyperphagia drops off. Now, sandwiched in, in, in between, are the, are the kids carrying melanocortin-4 receptor mutations? And Sadaf was just analyzing them as they came through, right? She only put them into these categories after I supplied the tissue culture um, um, experiments. So an experiment done on recombinant protein in tissue culture was able to predict how much a child would actually eat within a, within a buffet scenario. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the MC4 receptor is not binary. It is not on or off. Okay, it is a rheostat, it's tunable. Not only does the number of receptors on the surface matter, the quality of the receptor on the surface actually matters as well. Now, what do I mean by common? So we just published, uh, we published this paper earlier in this year, I think March or March or April. And this was a collaboration with um, a, a group in Bristol, Nick Timpson, Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Wade, who uh, run the AVEN Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children or LSPAC. Now, this is a birth cohort as opposed to a disease cohort, you know, where you, you recruit for disease. A birth cohort is you take all comers. And for here, these were women pregnant between 1990 and 1992 who were recruited and living in the area of Bristol. Okay. And so we, we, we took this and then they also have longitudinal measures, anthropometric, et cetera, et cetera, of these kids as they go. They're now in the third. They're now, they're now just 30 years old because this has been 1990 to 1992. And so we screened the MC4 receptor in this cohort and found that 0.3%, okay? Uh, oh, and then, and, then, and then functionally tested all of the mutations we found. And there were some that were wild type, et cetera, et cetera. But we took all the ones that were loss of function and we found that 0.3% of all comers carry a mutation MC4 receptor 
making them loss a uh, 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 loss of function. So they actually have MC4R deficiency. Now, if you extrapolate 0.3 percent, that's 200,000 people in the UK. If you extrapolate it to a larger place like United States, that's more than a million. Okay, so what are the effects? What effect do you actually see? Now, as I said, these are longitudinal studies. And so you can pick a, pick a day, pick a, an, um, an age. And so we picked 18, adulthood. And at 18 years old, if you carried one copy of a mutated MC4 receptor, you were on average 18 kilograms heavier, ladies and gentlemen, times 2.2, that is 40 pounds, there and about. Okay, this is equivalent to five BMI points between 20, 25, 25, and 30. Okay, and of that 18 kilos, 15 kilos is going to be fat. And so this is 200, the phenotype you see in 200,000 people potentially within, um, um, within, this, within this country. It is a key, it is certainly a key driver when it comes to uh, some of the more severe obese certainly within, within this country. And the magic of this all is we now have a treatment for it. And so this is work that was done by the same crew that found the original POMC kid, Annette Grutes, Heiko Kruda. Okay, this is now 20, 2016, and this is working with a pharma company called Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, who developed a melanocortin agonist called Set Melanotide. So here's the data, and you can see here's the growth curves of the two POMC, POMC deficient children that they tested, red bar and blue bar, the growth curves, and you can see their weights. On the right-hand side is body weight in kilograms, ladies and gentlemen. So this, the, the one the red bar is 160 kilograms. That's a lot of kilograms, so I'm going to point out. You know, and then this, the, the slightly smaller individual here, patient two, is 145 kilograms. For perspective, I'm 75 kilograms, okay? Just, just, just to put things in perspective. And then they were treated. So red bar first. So red bar was treated for 42 weeks. Once again, weight loss in kilos. 50 kilogram loss in 42 weeks. And how about patient two, treated for a shorter period of time, 12 weeks, lost 22 kilograms. So rate of loss of weight, exactly the same. We have not seen that degree of pharmaceutically assisted weight loss since leptin, leptin was given to the original leptin deficient kids. And it has really um, energized the whole, um, the whole melanocortin field and, 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 and the body weight field. Now, I, I mentioned, I'm gonna to tell you about how it's been conserved through, through, through evolution. Um, and you might think, well, humans, mice, what else can they be? <clears throat> well, if you actually look now broader in terms of from an agricultural perspective. So um, there are now, we know that, you know, when farmers breed animals, pigs, for example, they're breeding for very specific traits, right? They're breeding for speed of growth, um, fat to lean mass ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And if you actually begin to look at some of these pigs, now these pigs have not been injected with anything. They're not genetically modified pigs. They're just picked for a given trait. And this particular pig, this pig is from Google. This is not the pig. But, but the pig within, with the, the line of pigs within this, within this paper is for bacon, okay? And as, they, as it turns out, the line they pick has a mutation within the melanocortin-4 receptor because of selection pressure. Now, this is not a weird mammalian thing, neither, all right? So let me introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to the blind Mexican cavefish. So, which begs the question, really, why are they blind and why are they Mexican? So let me, so these are boring fish, normal fish with eyes, very passe. So these are the blind Mexican cavefish. So that big asteroid, which kind of slammed into earth 65 million years ago and killed all the dinosaurs. Well, what happens is they, it, it hit what is now the Gulf of Mexico, hence Mexican, all okay? right? And they made these cracks sort of in the ground, which, which ended up filling with water. They became underwater caves. And so some fish got stuck in these underwater caves. So aside from it being in Mexico, the problem with an underwater cave is there's no light, okay? And so what happened was the fish that got stuck in there over generations lost their eyes because it just evolved away. That's why they're blind because they don't need, they don't, they don't need their eyes. But what is interesting is in addition to it being dark, okay, and, and in Mexico, there is also very little food within, within an within a, um, underwater cave. So any fish, that was remotely blase about some plankton or seaweed that was actually coming by and didn't snap it up, it became an X fish. All of the fish, blind Mexican cave fish today that survive have mutations within the MC4 receptor. Why? Because it was what kept them alive. So here, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Okay, this is a fish. It's a pig that humans have bred, Labradors. Where is the choice? 200,000 people in this country. Where is the choice? For our feeding behavior, for many of us, for many creatures, great and small, is hardwired 
in response to the environment that we've actually been uh, um, um, raised in. So I promised you I would talk to, to you about some new data. Um, so that's the MC4 receptor. Let me just take a very quick uh, um, um, segue, shall we say, just briefly. Um, to the MC3 receptor, because for the longest time, we were thinking the MC3 receptor also played a similar role, okay, as the MC4 receptor. Could it be a BMI gene, et cetera, et cetera? So in about 2000, once again, ODOG, a couple of groups, Lex Vendeplerg, uh, a group, I think he was at Merck at the time, knocked out the MC3 receptor, and Roger Cohn's group also knocked out the MC3 receptor. And let me give you the phenotype. This was in the turn of the millennium increased fat mass and reduced lean body mass, okay? So not really obesity. Now, if you look at the abstract for Roger Cohn's group, homozygous null mice, while not significantly overweight, so they're not obese, I point out, exhibit at approximately 50 to 60% increase in adipose mass. So if they're the same weight and have an increase in adipose mass, they have less lean mass. So this is the kind of phenotype that we're actually, we're actually looking at. Fast forward to 2020, 2021, and we now have a really good idea about how um, about what the MC3 receptor is actually doing. And so to, just to introduce you now to, to more cohorts that, that we're actually talking about, the, the, the wonder of the new world we're living in is we are living in a world where there is a democratization of genetics. When we were doing the MC4 receptor stuff, we were sequencing it, we were going through all of the things, right? Whereas now, they are now in large and enormous cohorts that are, that are actually available in which all the genes, the whole exomes, and sometimes whole genomes have been sequenced, and they're online, they're open access. As long as you have the wherewithal, the skill, the bioinformatic capability in order to look at it, you can look at the data. And so I want to focus on three, um, um, three cohorts here, ALSPAC, which I just talked to you about, birth cohort, okay, about 12,000 kids, all right, UK Biobank. This is half a million people. Okay, so um, so this is going to be cross-sectional, one 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 snapshot, but then half a million. So you got power. Okay, uh, um, um, within the UK, we have we have all the exomes for this done. And genes and health. Now, genes and health is a London, Bradford, and Birmingham-based study. Fifty thousand or so people enriched for um, people that have come across from Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, um, and with a really quite a high level of consanguinity within the population. So here, the genes and health are enriched for homozygous mutations. UK Biobank gives you power. LSPAC gives you longitudinal data, okay? So each of those gave you different information. Now, focusing on the MC3 receptor, we then found out, okay, well, what happens if you don't have the MC3 receptor? Now, as it turns out, when we focus on low frequency um, 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 mutations, now this, we didn't, uh, what we did now was we, we looked for everything that was there and then we functionally tested them. And like the MC4 receptor, some of them were partially functional and some of them were completely dead, okay? Now, one of them, as it turns out, of um, a couple of the completely dead ones are relatively common. Actually, no, they were very rare, but because you can actually look in UK Biobank, half a million, you end up with a lot. So for example, F45S, which is somewhere here, F45S, which you can sell as a triangle, is dead. Okay, it's, it's flat. Okay, it's found in one in 700 individuals. So, but one in 700 or 500,000 people is seven or 800 people. Okay, so suddenly you have the power to then ask, to ask questions. So what do humans carrying loss of function mutations in the MC4 receptor look like? Well, first of all, they have a later onset of puberty. And not only do they have a later onset of puberty, depending on the mutation you have and how loss of function, so like the MC4 receptor, the MC3 receptor is not binary, okay? So the, the F45S is the most severe mutation we found. R220S slightly less. V44I, we could barely tell if it was actually loss of function, but this was a GWAS signal. And you can see that the more severe, the most severe F45S was nearly half a year delayed in puberty, about 5.5 months, okay, delayed in, 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 in puberty. They had reduced linear growth and reduced lean mass. So they were shorter and, and had less and had less lean mass. We don't know, don't know too much about the fat. They have reduced IGF-1 levels, insulin-like insulin -like growth factor, probably driving this reduced uh, um, um, li li linear growth. And crucially, there is zero signal, zero signal on BMI. We can now categorically state that the MC3 receptor is not important for BMI. It's important for other things about your body shape and size and height and what have you, but not for BMI. So not actually for, not actually for obesity. Now, then within the genes and health cohort, we found a rare mutation 
that was also completely dead. I didn't. I, I showed you the data previously, but this is a complete dead mutation. So this patient, this has no has no MC3 receptor, and what he shows is an exaggerated phenotype compared to the heterozygous carriers, who every everyone in the previous slide was heterozygous. So what is key here is that now we see that the MC3 receptor is not required for puberty. Because while this gentleman here went into puberty in his late, in his early 20s, he subsequently fathered, fathered three children. So he's not infertile. We did check, the children were his. We checked. Okay. Um, um, so he, he's not infertile. So while MC3 receptor appears to be uh, regulating the timing of puberty, is not required for puberty. Very big difference. Um, he also has a high percentage of body fat. So the, the, the phenotypes were just exaggerated compared to what we saw in, in, in the heterozygote, which is, which is really quite a good thing because it shows that there is a spectrum. And actually it begins to confirm that the MC3 receptor is like the MC4 receptor in which it's tunable. It is a real stat, okay, for, for, for everything that is there. Now the role, so unlike what we've done previously, we actually started to work in humans and then went back to mice to answer questions we couldn't look at in humans. So we know this is, this, this is relevant. And so there is a conserved role of MC3 receptor in mice. So first of all, we see that reproductive maturity in males or females is later when you have a knockout. Once again, they're not infertile, but we don't expect them to be infertile. And one of the interesting um, um, phenotypes we saw um, was that now typically, typically, um, um, mammals, in particular mice, because they're really tiny, if you fast them, they stop cycling. Now, do we uh, stop, uh, um, their the estrus cycle stops. You can see these in women who, um, um, who, who, who lose all their fat when they're elite runners, for example, and they stop cycling. Well, in mice, you just have to fast them. So this is wild type mice. D stands for diestrus, E is estrus, mid estrus. And you can see that it suddenly stops when you fast them. And when you stop the fast, they start cycling again. All right. Whereas if you actually look at the MC3 knockout mice, they are completely, uh, um, um, their brain cannot sense the fast, at least when it comes to cycling. And so they continue cycling um, even with the fast. So without the MC3 receptor, they appear to be unable to transfer the nutritional signal into the, in, into the reproductive pathway. So how could it be happening? And so we have a um, single cell uh, uh, program. And so what we did was, uh, this is single cell sequencing data from the hypothalamus. Um, and we pulled out all of the single cell hypothalamic stuff in a mouse hypothalamus that expressed the MC3 receptor. And here are all the MC3 receptor genes. And what we see is that the MC3 receptor is enriched in hypothalamic populations of GHRH, so there's growth hormone releasing hormone probably uh, um, um, mechanistically explaining the growth phenotype and in KISP1 neurons, KISP peptide neurons, because these are, are absolutely responsible um, for reproduction, okay, and for reproduction, uh, reproductive signaling. So we think that this is how the MC3 receptor, where it sits in the brain in order to mediate its function. And just to be clear, we then looked at human hypothalamic samples, and this is using RNA scope. Okay, and we see exactly the same thing that the MC3 receptor in human hypothalamus is also co-expressed with KISS1 and GHRH, so it's conserved in humans as well. So the summary of the MC3 uh, receptor story is, is, is this. So humans who carry a loss of function mutations have later onset of puberty, reduced linear growth, lean mass, IGF1 levels. Um, the mice, in effect, I won't read this out, the mice, in effect, show, show, show exactly the same thing. And we show from a, from a, a brain neuroanatomy perspective where MC3R is expressed and likely to be, to be performing its, its, um, its functions. And so we'd like to report for the first time that MC3 regulates the timing of sexual maturation, the rate of linear growth, and the accrual of lean mass. So this is our current model, ladies and gentlemen. So we are at the moment uh, um, that what are the global secular trends look like in terms of body weight? Well, we know we, we are becoming more obese as a, as, as a species, this, this we know. But coupled with that, we're also becoming taller. Okay? And actually, on average, we are getting our puberty earlier. And we think that part of the way this happens is, a, is the melanocortin pathway, but in a bifurcating manner. Okay? So nutrient signals come in from, peer, from, from leptin or from insulin. I didn't talk about insulin. Okay, and via the MC4 receptor, it does appetite regulation. I've showed you this, okay, and energy storage, in particular in fat. But via the MC3 receptor, it links the nutritional requirements you have to timing of puberty, which is critical, 
okay, and linear growth, which is also which is also critical, and it's different from storing fat. It's it's somatic growth go, go, going upwards, and we think that this is the role um, of the of the melanocortin uh, pathway. Do I have five more minutes, Dover? Yep. Okay. So so now just just to, to to end the story to actually give some um some relevance to all of you, okay, aside from the two hundred thousand people who don't actually. Uh, who carry mutations in the MC4 receptor. Now, these are monogenic conditions, right? Mono, single gene conditions. Whereas the vast majority of us, our body weight is not going to be influenced by one gene. It's going to be interested in, influenced by many genes, polygenes. And we now have a really good understanding about the genetic architecture underlying, I say common obesity, actually underlying body weight in general, because it's the full, it's the full spectrum. So this Jackson Pollock diagram, I want you to take away two messages. So a couple of things. So first of all, you notice that there are two big group of gene, big groups of genes. There's the pink group up here, and there's a big blue blob down here. Now these genes in pink, as it turns out, indicate your are, are associated with waist to hip ratio. So the circumference of your waist over the circumference of your hip. And if you think about it, the ratio gives you body shape. Do I have a big bottom or a small tummy, big tummy? Do I look like a sausage? <laughs> Am I big all over? Right. So so it is where you put your fat. Okay. And the, the genes in blue, however, are, are associated with BMI independent of where you put your fat. So this is how, how much fat you carry. So message number one, where you put your fat has nothing to do with how much fat you have. First message. Now, as it turns out, second message, where you put your fat has to do with genes that act in your fat, adipocyte biology. Whereas how much fat you have has to do with genes within your brain, and where we know their function influence food intake and feeding behavior. This is another way of looking at the data. For those of you who don't look at this, this is, uh, this is a um, Manhattan plot because it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. Um, I've worked on the gene FTO for 15, 15 years of my life. For those younger amongst you listening to me, I'm, I haven't said it once uh, of this gene. Do you know why? Because it's a very sad story. So I'm not gonna tell you a sad story. Aside from the fact, to stress the point that these are not mutations, half of you listening to me, are going to carry one copy of the risk allele, which makes you a kilo and a half heavier than the person who doesn't. One sixth of you, or about 1.2 billion people in the world, are going to be homozygous for for mutate for polymorphisms. Pardon me, in MC4 and for polymorphisms in FTO, which make you on average three kilos heavier, or 50% more likely to end up being obese over your lifetime. But all of you are going to have some mix of these genes, and I just wanted to highlight. Oh, these are polymorphisms now. Highlight two of them. Left hand side, that's POMC of Labrador fame. Okay, right hand side, there we have the melanocortin 4 receptor. Now we know that severe mutations in this key fat sensing pathway, the leptin melanocortin pathway, result in severe obesity and phenotypes. Just showed you all. Okay, but very, very, very subtle mutation uh, uh, polymorphisms influence where you sit on a normal distribution of body weight. So now the, the buzzy thing these days are polygenic risk scores, polygenic risk scores. And we can actually uh, add up all these alleles that we have and plot them again. So more of these risk alleles and plot them against BMI. And if you look at enough people, first of all, you see a normal distribution. Secondly, if you plot uh, um, with enough people, you see, you see a linear relationship. So the more you have, the more you're likely to be, end up being heavier. But yes, can we then find these people, these people with high genetic risk and predict, intervene, even when they're babies, do something about it, right? And now look, there are companies that claim to be able to do this. So companies like 23andMe, DNA Fit, all the genetic, uh, uh, genetic testing companies leverage polygenic risk scores. That's how it works, all right? And then they use the polygenic risk score of your whatever genes you have and try to make predictions. The problem is, don't waste your time for now, is they fundamentally misunderstand the difference between population level risk which you need to look at hundreds of thousands of people and using it as a diagnosis. It just, it just doesn't work and um, doesn't work for now. So two last thoughts and then I'll shut the hell up. So am I giving anyone any excuse? Back to my first thought. And no, I think we all got to consider our, our, our genes like a genetic hand of cards and you can have good hands, you can have bad hands and really the only people you can blame are your parents because that's where they came from, all right? But you can win with a bad hand in poker, for example. It's just more difficult. I'll give you another example. I will never, ever run as fast as Usain Bolt. And it's because of my genes and I'm sticking to it. But it doesn't mean that if I train, I won't run faster than I do now. People misunderstand what genetics can tell us. They do not determine who you are. 
your genes clearly bracket a set of possibilities. Clearly, all right? Why am I bald? Because of my genes. Why do I look Chinese? Because of my genes. But when we actually find out what the bracket of possibilities are, you can move up and down depending on how rich or poor you are, depending on whether you have kids, depending on where you live, et cetera, et cetera, depending whether or not you make good or bad choices, maybe, all right? Move up and down. Geneticists are simply trying to understand the bracket that is there, not trying to give anyone any excuse. So are we all sinners, ladies and gentlemen? What's a sin? What's a sin? A sin I'm Catholic. What's a sin? A sin is a bad thing that you choose to do anyway. This is me choosing to eat a pizza. So I said that food intake and body weight is not a choice. Of course, it's a choice. You're saying you're eating the damn pizza, right? So look, we do not gain or lose weight overnight. This is an important point. Um, we don't. You might think we do, but we don't. Our body weight is a function of thousands of different feeding uh, uh, events over the past few years. Imagine if because of your genetic hand of cards, you are 5% less likely to be able to say no to the slice of pizza. So one hour of every 20 times you said, hang it, I'm going to have the slice of pizza. So over thousands of feeding events, that is hundreds of thousands of calories different, okay? In casino terms, if the dice is weighted wrong, the house will always win. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, over the time period where food intake can change your body weight, it is not a choice, okay? So it is important for us to understand as society that people living with obesity are not bad, slothful, or morally bereft, okay? They are fighting their biology. It doesn't change the physics. It doesn't change the physics. They still need to eat less to lose weight. But until we as society understand that for some people it's always more difficult than others, we'll never solve the problem. This is me choosing to eat the broccoli. Um, very quickly, I just want to thank um, Stephen O'Ratley, uh, my senior colleagues, and Tony Cole. Eleanor Raffin, I mentioned the work. The guys in bold up here did primarily um, um, the work. And this paper on MC3R comes out tomorrow at 4 p.m., I am reliably told. Um, and I thought I'd just list everyone here so I don't piss anyone off. So uh, listen, I'm based at the MRC Metabolic Diseases Unit. I went too long. I'm really sorry about that. But it's been a distinct pleasure to speak to you. And I'm very happy to do Q&A. Thank you, Giles, for that fascinating talk. And you can catch up on Giles's most recent work on the publication mentioned here. Next week, join us when we welcome Dr. Duncan Astle, group leader at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit, when he will be talking to us on transdiagnostic approaches to understanding neurodevelopment. For more information on talks in this series and on Cambridge Neuroscience itself, please follow us on Twitter and follow the links below. See you next time.